Rick Tobin and Brown, a.k.a. The Red Baron. If ever there was a story that needed to accurately be told in a feature film, it would be the famous story of Rittmeister Baron Manfred von Richthofen and Captain Roy Brown. And in 1970, filmmaker Roger Corman took a swing at it. Released in 1971 as Richthofen and Brown, and in some countries as the Red Baron, it is a fictionalized portrayal of the air war in Europe during World War I, which centers around the German ace Manfred von Richthofen and his enemy counterpart, Canadian Captain Roy Brown of the British Royal Air Force. Made on less than a $1 million budget, the film has some surprisingly good aerial footage and set work, with very convincing mock-ups for crash scenes. Sadly, for reasons known only to the producers, the film departs from reality in many ways, some of which are understandable and some of which make you wonder. First, I wanted to cover the major errors in the movie, but I feel obligated to remind everyone that this was a large-scale film made on a very tight budget. Number one. The wrong aircraft. Except for the Baron's triplane, most of the aircraft types are wrong. Now this is actually somewhat forgivable because the correct type simply did not exist. Corman was only able to make the film because aerial coordinator Lynn Garrison had the aircraft facilities left over from the movie The Blue Max, which was made five years earlier. They were available for use in Ireland and for a good price. Most of the British planes were stamps, converted to look like SE-5s, but in reality, Brown Squadron flew soft with camels, which bear little resemblance to the SE-5. There were fairly authentic-looking custom-built aircraft, such as the German Fowls or Fokker D-7s, but the Baron Squadron flew albatrosses and halberstats. This tends to ruin the movie for any knowledgeable aviophile or history buff, but in his defense, Corman had to use what was available. That being said, it is perhaps the movie's most glaring technical error. Number 2. The Casting of John Philip Law as the Red Baron this was odd given that Richthofen was only 5 foot 8 inches tall and Law was 6 foot 5. Law towers over the small aircraft as well as his fellow actors. The Baron, seen here, does not. Number 3. The Early Battles Between Brown and Richthofen Combat between the Baron and Brown before the final duel were total fiction, as Richthofen's Jagdstaffels were mobile and changed locations often, as did the British. They did not fight a fixed enemy squadron. Ergo, the idea of these enemies repeatedly dueling the same squadrons was off the mark. Additionally, the Baron never shot down Captain Brown as seen in the movie, and there is no evidence that they had ever seen each other in combat before the Baron's death. Number 4. The Baron was not wounded by Brown's squadron. Although forced down several times, Richthofen was not wounded by Brown's squadron. In fact, he was wounded by a squadron flying the odd-looking FE-2Ds. Despite their ungainly appearance, they bristled with guns. Number 5. The Airfield Attacks Yes, squadrons did attack each other's airfields, but again, not these two squadrons. And the notion that the Germans happened to get their new planes minutes after the British raid, assembled them, and counterattack on the same day is ludicrous. Also, most airfields were dotted with anti-aircraft machine guns in case of just such an attack. Number six, the interplay between Brown and the other officers is all wrong. Brown is portrayed as a Royal Flying Corps officer with a roguish, cocky, tough guy attitude who thinks outside the box for a way to avenge the death of squadron leader Leno Hawker. In fact, Brown was not only not in Leno Hawker's squadron, he was not even in Leno Hawker's branch of service at that point. Roy Brown was actually a naval officer at this time, and he was a highly dedicated pilot who often flew even when he was sick. In April of 1918, just 20 days before the fateful battle, the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps were merged into what was now the Royal Air Force, and Brown's naval squadron was renamed Number 209 Squadron. Now he was a captain in the Royal Air Force. Number 7. Belka was not hit by Gehring. Belka was hit by a friendly aircraft in a mid-air collision which caused his death, but it was not Gehring's aircraft. The film needed a German antagonist for the Baron, one that even the Germans could hate, and Gehring made the perfect candidate. If you have to ask why, read some history. Number 8. The Battle for the Baron when he was shot down the first time. The Baron was hit in the head, but he forced landed behind friendly lines. He did not crash in no man's land, and there was no battle for him in his plane. Ironically, the crash in this scene is one of the better special effects of the movie. Number 9. There was no running dogfight between the Baron and Brown. Brown made a gun pass, shot up the Baron's plane, and swooped away. 
The Baron was then also hit by ground fire. Many believe that he was actually killed by Australian machine gunner Sergeant Cedric Popkin, but even Popkin said the world will likely never know for certain. Number 10. Stupid Scenes Time and film are wasted on seduction and bar fight scenes that are best edited out. Number 11. Nitpicks You will also need to overlook such things as German soldiers with British rifles and endless ammunition in the guns. Lovingly known as Hollywood magazines. Now that I've picked apart the movie's shortcomings, let me talk about what I liked in the movie. Number one, using real airplanes. Putting actors in the real airplanes and shooting live in the air gave this film a most authentic and realistic feel. Sadly, these shots do not blend well with the ground stage static cockpit shots, but it's not horrible. Aerial coordinator Lynn Garrison even taught actors Stroud and Law to take off and land their own planes for a more realistic look in these shots. Number two, fair display of a horrible death. Slasher flicks have got nothing on the real life terrors that faced World War I aviators, and the movie was fair in showing how violent and fiery an aviator's death could be. This is made even more evident in the two airfield attack scenes, which are actually pretty well done. They are merciless attacks by both sides, but then this was modern war. Number three, the Baron did die chasing Wap May. It is correct that the Baron was chasing Wolford Wap May when Brown attacked him. They left out that it was followed by a hail of ground fire, but given the film's title, this is understandable. Number four, it showed Herman Goering taking over the squadron. Herman Goering did, in fact, take over the Yasta after the Baron's death. Number five, the Baron's funeral. This film does credit to the respect the Allies showed the Baron after his death. It showed that the Australians gave the Baron a proper funeral with full military honors. Number six, it is true that Brown had ulcers. Roy Brown was sick much of the time he was deployed, possibly from bad food. He had lost weight and was in and out of hospitals. Number seven, Rick Tofen's trophy collection. The Red Baron did collect trophies from his victims' planes and had little cups to celebrate his victories. Number eight, the Red Triplane. The movie is correct that he got the famous Red Triplane for which he is so identified quite late in his career and scored only 19 of his 80 victories in it, but it is the airplane in which he died. Number nine, he was close to his mother. The portrayal of the Baron's relationship with his mother is by all accounts accurate. He has a close relationship with her which was delicately and I think accurately shown in the film. Overall the movie is a watchable war film despite its inaccuracies. Just don't take it as a true telling of the actual story. Given the budget they were operating on I personally feel they actually did a very respectable job. Especially in that they did not glorify the war. They showed it as a horrible violent thing and it was. They also touched on a few other things, such as the Baron being aristocracy and Brown being a commoner. You're not beaten over the head with these points, but it's nice to show the difference between the two men, and that was pretty honest. Ironically, only nine days after the Baron's shootdown, Brown himself was admitted to hospital with influenza and nervous exhaustion. He was made an instructor at an air fighting school, but never returned to combat. He was involved in a bad air crash in July and was hospitalized for five months. Brown died as a relatively young man at the age of 50, passing away in 1944 from a heart attack, and it is very possible that his heart had been permanently weakened by the illnesses and injuries that he suffered in the First World War. Given the limited budget that they had, I'm going to give this film a 6.5 out of 10. Some people might say 7. Judge for yourself. I recommend you go ahead and watch it.